Yuri, it's great to see you here today. Um, first question is something that made the headlines uh, a few weeks ago, and I'd like to just to tell us a little bit more about the announcement that you're developing a vaccine for cancer and you're on track to have it by the end of the decade. Hi, nice to see you, Yao. <laughs> and yes, we are working. We are working on cancer vaccines. Uh, and uh, just to remind remind you, um, a vaccine is is a way to inform the immune system. And in the in the setting of a um, COVID or infectious disease vaccine, we inform the immune system by delivering an mRNA uh, to describe the virus proteins. And for a cancer vaccine, the idea is to, to redirect the immune system uh, against cancer cells by delivering uh, proteins and, and features <clears throat> that are only on cancer cells. And this is something, something <clears throat> more difficult than for uh, developing an infectious disease vaccine because in the infectious disease setting, we want to prevent the infection. And in the cancer setting, we want to treat an existing disease. That means the tumor cells are already there. And this is, this is more complicated and comes with additional challenges. But we have made uh, a lot of progress in the, in the last years. We are seeing the first, uh, first um, evidence uh, for activity. And we will continue this development until we can prove that this type of vaccines are effective. Uh, for treatment of cancer, and we expect in the uh, indeed uh, latest end of the, uh, um, end of the 2020s uh, to come up with an approved vaccine. And can you give us a sense in terms of the the types of cancer that this can target and the clinical trials that are ongoing at the moment? <clears throat> yeah. So <clears throat> the exciting aspect is that the type of treatment for cancer vaccination is, um, is um, if it works, it could work in a cancer type independent manner. So that means in this type of treatments, every cancer has its uh, different antigens and, uh, and we would do that in a personalized manner. We are currently working on cancer vaccines, for example, uh, for treatment of colorectal cancer. Uh, we are working on vaccines um, uh, um, against melanoma, uh, we are working on uh, vaccines against head and neck cancer. So this already shows that this type of approach yeah, is in principle eligible for different type of cancers. Okay. And, and for those who don't know, he, this is cancer va vaccination was, was the actual, the original research you were doing before COVID came along. Were there any lessons from the pandemic that now you can transfer into into well, reigniting your, your original research, really? Yeah, that's a great question. In, indeed, we, we have learned during the, uh, when developing uh, our COVID-19 vaccine, yeah, and that, um, the, um, uh, that the process can be, can, can be much faster. Yeah? Uh, we have generated not only efficacy data in the infectious disease setting, but we much better understand how the immune system uh, reacts against, against this type of vaccines. We have generated safety data from hundreds of millions of individuals showing that this type of vaccines, vaccines are safe and tolerated well yeah, in, the, in the large population. And of course, and, um, the, the development of the COVID vaccines validated the platform, so it is now accepted as a therapeutic platform, safe therapeutic platform, which makes our work much easier. Yeah. You recently wrote an article for Wired, uh, for, which is going to be out uh, in Wired World, and you talk about also malaria and tuberculosis, all right? What is the limit for the messenger RNA technology in terms of um, the sort of diseases that you can tackle uh, moving forward? Yes, we are considering to, to use mRNA for different types of infectious diseases. And malaria and tuberculosis are diseases which have a high, extremely high mortality, particularly in, in, in the poor uh, countries uh, um, like Africa and Asia uh, and South America. And um, the, the 
the question here is, can we solve challenges that are that can't, couldn't be solved with, with um, existing vaccine technologies using mRNA? And we believe it is possible, for example, by combining multiple antigens in one vaccine. So is there a limit for using mRNA vaccines? Definitely. If we don't have an information about about what is driving this disease, if we don't have an information uh, how we can get a protection, if a virus is uh, is able to repetitively escape, for example, HIV is a is a extremely uh, difficult to address virus because it's continuously changing. Yeah? Uh, we can't just say the mRNA vaccine will do it. So that means we have really to have a scientific basis uh, on which we can rely uh, to develop a treatment. And this is true for any type of treatment. Obviously, uh, fighting this, this virus was not just about inventing the vaccine, but also manufacturing at scale and also deploying it. Now, you recently announced as well the, the invention of this shippable modular manufacturing facilities called Biontainers. If I'm correct, there's going to one be uh, open in Rwanda next March. Um, is this going to change everything in terms of how we can tackle future epidemics? It is, it is an important, important additional tool. So um, uh, when we were uh, when we uh, we were faced with the huge need of vaccines, uh, uh, just directly after our vaccine was approved, we realized we realized we have to produce much more doses than we originally anticipated. And the first way that we that we uh, that we use is to increase the capacity in a centralized fashion, which allowed us to deliver. To, to, to deliver our vaccine to more than 160 countries. But still, uh, many regions uh, on the planet uh, 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 which do not have an own manufacturing um, uh, fa facility uh, would require uh, the setup of this new type of technology because it is it provides really a lot of opportunities. The question is, how can we do it in a manner, in a sustainable manner? And for that, we developed a container-based system. And the idea is very simple. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it is used in the computer industry. So th that means we generate a manufacturing facility, which is small, yeah, uh, uh, and could allow us to, to produce 50 to 80 million doses of the vaccine per year. And this is with standardized equipment. And the standardized equipment is set up in Germany uh, with the manufacturing facility. And this is a container-based system. And then these containers are shipped to, to any site. And our first container is intended to be shipped to Rwanda in Africa. Yeah? And, um, and then they can set up as a clone of, of the manufacturing facility. And we use the digital, digital systems to copy paste the processes. So that means we have solved two problems. One, the uh, setting up fast a manufacturing facility, and second, uh, to set up the processes. So we believe that this container-based system, which we call Biontainer, could allow us in a copy-paste manner to deliver uh, manufacturing modules to any place on, on the planet. Uh, this is a beginning. It will require many years until we can build a global manufacturing network. The idea is to have 10, 15, 20, of these modules worldwide. And, and the idea is to have a centralized way um, to, uh, to control this manufacturing network. So that means every time a new vaccine is developed, yeah, the processes could be, could be, could be submitted just by, um, by, by data. And people who are trained to use this biontainer can just uh, start to manufacture the new vaccine. If we can establish that, that would solve an important problem. That means that that regardless where in the world, everyone can start to produce its own vaccines in a timely fashion. And and this technology, if I'm correct, also uh, the way it uses energy and water is also sustainable. Uh, how? Tell me about that sustainability factor, which is quite key to to this, to this vaccine. Yes, this, uh, yes, indeed. We we. <laughs> 
So this is a completely new way in in manufacturing vaccines, and and um, and uh, one of the challenges, of course, of course, of uh, GMP factories is uh, that they are not energy neutral. Uh, there is there is a lot of of um, air purification which which comes with uh, with energy consumptions. What we do is we have uh, we are going to install uh, solar panels. Yeah, and uh, and the goal is um, to that that with the so, so solar panel system that we have a, a completely energy neutral uh, factory. Yeah, and that that enables enables manufacturing 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 according to the to the quality standards that are now established in Europe or United States in the in the in the normal. Normal type of factors. And tell me, uh, the WHO declared climate breakdown as one of the, the, the leading threats to public health. I mean, you just helped solve one of the biggest crises in humanity. But as a immune researcher, as a vaccinologist, how much is this uh, climate change factors into your thinking and into BioNTech's sort of forward strategy? Yeah, from the medical perspective. Uh, there is already well known uh, that climate change yeah, and pollution is affecting many diseases. Yeah. For example, we know that, uh, that the mortality based on COVID-19 is particularly high, high in regions which have a high, high uh, pollution. Yeah. And uh, so we, we see that many diseases are, are driven, driven by, by, by climate change. We have also to consider um, that that due to the climate change, but also due to the urbanization yeah, and increased traveling, we will see a higher likelihood of new pandemics with new new newly emerging infectious disease pathogens. So we need to prepare ourselves to address that. Yeah, and we are preparing ourselves by continuously um, developing and improving our technologies to be able. For example, uh, for uh, if a new outbreak happens, to react even faster and ensure that we can respond uh, within weeks and not within months. Many, many questions here from our audience. I'm, I'm going to ask you a few. How can we get the population to trust science again after so many cycles of misinformation around vaccines and COVID? Obviously, this, this, this is very relevant to climate breakdown as well. Yeah, this is this is a general problem. I don't have a, a solution for that. I think we, we we need to continue to do what what is good. Yeah, we have to continue uh, to transparently share information. We have to uh, make clear which information is trustable. Yeah, we have to provide direct links to the original data. Yeah, and we have to to continue to build a journalism. And train media in a way, in a way, and that they continue to to communi communicate in a consistent fashion. There is there is nothing nothing else what 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 I could say now. Yeah, um, in in trying to to uh, to make the true information, the facts, yeah, uh, being being uh, dis disseminated faster and more sustainably. Um, another question here. Uh have you considered, I mean, we, we, we talked a little bit about that, but given uh, this mass scale vaccination that we, we, we're going to go through uh, now, uh, what about the issue of medical waste? What actions are people taking to deal with all the medical waste that comes from, from this, this um, vaccination? Yeah, that's, that's, that's in, in, an important concern. Also the questions, for example, of shipping vaccine doses and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and ensuring ensuring to minimize the waste. So one one of the one of the aspects that we are addressing is that our first generation vaccines had to be shipped at minus 80 degree, yeah, which meant that that we really really uh, needed a, a, a lot of cooling systems, yeah, uh, 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 space consuming systems, and we try to reduce that. Uh, by, for example, developing vaccines that can be transported at room temperature. 
yeah that already helps yeah uh, um, however however uh, the most important aspect is uh, vaccines are in principle clean yeah so the mrna vaccines are in principle clean we do not need huge factories yeah we do not need for example the 60 20000 30000 liter fermenters we do that in relatively small ferment fermenters with 40 to 250 liters yeah so it is it is an effective way in producing vaccines so for the world population uh, it's about yeah so we need about uh, um, uh, 300 to 600 kilogram yeah, of mRNA is sufficient uh, to to supply to supply uh, uh, a billion uh, of of people, which is which is really an effective way yeah, in redu reducing reducing garbage and uh, and uh, reducing reducing the the, the waste. Yeah? Uh, another question related to public health, given. Again, the lessons of the pandemic and how we had to tackle it. How can we combine better testing, data collection, and tracking to improve health in general? Are there lessons that could be transferred from uh, the the situation of with COVID to to yeah. perennial issues with public health? Uh, so, what was uh, what was uh, a small revolution in the in the in the during the pandemic? Uh, was the the uh, the um, the emergence of real world data yeah, as a as a tool to inform about uh, about about um, the efficacy of vaccines and about about potential side effects yeah and what was really nice to see that that different that data from different countries for example from Israel uh, from from uh, uh, Sweden from UK from the United States yeah were consistently showing the more or less the same data yeah and uh, and this type of data give us on the one side really credibility for the vaccines but it also shows which which are factors uh, have factors or environmental factors which affect affect um, uh, the for example uh, um, the the response for vaccines but also also disease severity yeah we now within within two years have a clear information who has a higher risk for getting a severe disease, the scientific community found out which genetic factors are important, important to consider to individual risk. So it just shows that public research at a large scale yeah, uh, can, can provide a great progress yeah, for understanding individual health, uh, uh, individual risk factors. So this is the most voted one, not a question, but a huge thank you to you and the BioNTech team for everything. Thank you, Jur. <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of the wide event again. Uh, thank you so, so much. Yeah. Thank you.